I've been looking forward to recording this episode for quite a while, because today we get to move into perhaps my favorite era of lyric poetry in the ancient world, which is the 7th century BC. Now, we've tracked the development of ancient poetry before the Greeks, and I explicitly said when we started this series of videos that I wanted to meditate on the poetry that came before Homer. You know, too often we look at Homer as, you know, the first poet, and before him there's nothing else. Um, and as we saw, we have many poetic traditions that rise and sometimes reach their apex and then pass away even before the Homeric era. But I want to look at the Homeric era today and look at it not through Homer, who deserves his own whole series of lectures, and there's you know plenty uh, online uh, and in voluminous texts that you can read about Homer, but I want to look at the poetry that's arising in the Homeric and post-Homeric age uh, that is very much in line with the Sumerian and Egyptian and Indian and Chinese poetry that we've seen before kind of seeing how Greece is doing this approach to ancient poetry. And I want to I want to think about particularly two things today. One, how are the Greek poets who are arising uh, in this early first millennium BC, how are they interacting with questions of divinity, of, you know, the poet slash priest or priestess who is talking to the gods? and both worshiping them and asking them for aid. But also I want to look um, at one of the themes that we looked at last time, which is this emerging focus not just on the human-divine relationship or the human's relationship with eternity, but also the human's relationship with those here on earth, the more everyday romantic or friendship relationships. So I want to look at a couple poems by the early lyric poet Sappho. Now, Sappho is a mythical character in her own right, similar to Homer. We don't know a whole lot about her, but plays and poems and songs and stories and novels have been written about her for almost 3,000 years because she's such a fascinating character. We don't know a lot about Sappho other than the fact that she uh, lived, grew up, had a career on the island of Lesbos, which is in uh, the eastern Mediterranean, very near present-day Turkey. Um, and we also know that probably she lived in Sicily for a while when there was some political turmoil in Lesbos that uh, required her family, who was um, rather well-to-do and had political connections. The political turmoil, turmoil seems to have uh, made it expedient for her family to be in Sicily for a while. So we both get an Eastern Mediterranean and sort of a Middle Mediterranean uh, viewpoint from Sappho. Now, sadly, Sappho's poetry has not survived well. It's pretty similar to the Sumerian poetry we have in this regard, where we have, you know, hints and fragments and sometimes whole poems or whole sections of a poem that we think maybe this is a whole poem, but we're not sure. Um, and in that, in that way, I think um, Sappho is rather like someone like Enheduanna. In fact, let's listen to one of the most complete poems we have of Sappho. This is uh, poem one. Um, which probably is a complete poem, and listen to how Sappho addresses the divine and think about how this is similar to and maybe a little different from uh, what we looked at with in Hedewana's uh, hymn to uh, Inanna. Aphrodite, on your immortal bright throne, please, wise-minded daughter of Zeus, I beg you, do not sear my sorrowing heart with more hurt, mistress of this soul. As you did with former requests, attend me, flee your father's fortress, and yielding, yoke your golden cart, your chariot drawn by flocks of sparrows with fleet wings, diving down the atmosphere, rear your beak steeds, glide across the darkening heart of earth, and halt your train at last in my room illumined goddess before me. Face divine and shining with joy, you asked, who hurt me? What's the matter with Sappho this time? How my sorrow could be relieved, reversed, or why I had called you? Who should I persuade with my wiles, you asked me? Who should plead before you to soothe your passions? Whose abuse has bruised your affections, Sappho? Who is this cruel one? Though you chase them, they will be chasing you soon. 
Though they shun gifts, they will be giving gifts soon. Though they don't love, oh, when my fire ignites them, they will be yearning. Help me even now. In my pain, divorce me from cleaving grief and from murmured gossip. Burst my longings' bonds as an ally battle, blade drawn beside me. I love this poem. It's one of the great um, both hymns in the Greek tradition, but also one of the great love poems of the ancient traditions. And <clears throat> what I want to think about today is how Sappho is both very much in line with the whole ancient world's tradition of calling on a goddess or god to help us in our trouble. We saw Inanna doing this with a <clears throat> political situation <clears throat> that she was having trouble with. But Sappho is having a much more common problem. Sappho is having a little bit of a love problem. And so um, she's asking Aphrodite, who is the goddess that you would call on in the Greek pantheon, because Aphrodite is, in fact, um, the goddess of love. And so she's calling on Aphrodite, and she's asking Aphrodite to come down and help her. But there's this uh, indication that Aphrodite uh, has helped her before. Um, Aphrodite uh, is dramatized as speaking to her and saying, um, uh, what's the matter with Sappho this time? Uh, there's this idea that, okay, this tends to happen, Sappho. You know, you fall in love, you call me, I come down. Okay, what's the trouble this time? So there's a little bit of an admission um, in this poem, a little bit of knowingness, where Sappho is kind of um, making fun of herself a little bit, like, oh, yeah, you know, I end up with love trouble. And there are many legends about Sappho and love. Um, you know, she's from the island of Lesbos, where there were uh, probably uh, colonies of, um, of artists, uh, mostly focused on women. And so, you know, you have long stories about women in love uh, in Lesbos. But also there's a, um, there's a tradition that says that Sappho... Uh, fell in love with a fisherman, uh, not another woman, but a man who uh, spurned her love. His name was Phaon, and uh, she, in despair, threw herself from the cliffs into the ocean and was seen no more. Now, there's another tradition um, that says, oh, no, she was actually happily married to a man, had a daughter, had a very normal life, um, and, you know, didn't you know, throw herself off the rocks in despair or have, you know, torrid love affairs. So we don't really know a lot about what Sappho's love life was actually like. It hasn't stopped people from, as I said before, writing plays and operas and novels about it. And it's fun to speculate. But what we have is the poetry. And this is a poetry that's not particularly interested in exploring the identity of the beloved. It's more this sort of fraught and almost self-critical relationship with the love goddess, saying, I need your help, and I know I tend to ask you, but please help me again. Maybe it's a little bit of an admission of the frailty of humans. And, you know, we, we get this uh, in the Egyptian, Sumerian, uh, and Indian poetry, that women and men who are mortals, um, we need help all the time. It's not like the divine... Uh, reaches out and helps us once and we're good. We tend to need help. We're frail creatures. And there's this acknowledgement of that and then a, a diving into the boldness of, no, I need help and you're going to help me. And we end with this image, which is a little bit, a little bit ironic um, for Aphrodite. That Aphrodite, she's not a companion in love. She's not, you know, your wingman. Um, she's an ally in battle. Now, this, this battle image that ends the poem, that would be more literally appropriate for someone like Athena or someone like Mars, who actually was a god or goddess of battle or battle prowess or tactics. But there's this idea that love is a battlefield, um, to quote the old song, um, and that Aphrodite can be our ally. It's really difficult to talk about Sappho's love poetry today um, because most of the things we say about it, love is a battlefield, feel cliche. And it's important to know that they feel cliche because Sappho is really establishing and inventing the ways that we talk about love in poetry. Homer does talk about romantic relationships, talks about marriage. Um, there's a lot that Homer establishes. But when it comes to love poetry, and especially the lover crying out for 
uh, for help from the gods. It's Sappho who really sets the stage and, and shapes the imaginative parameters for how love poetry is going to develop in Greece and then eventually uh, in the Western tradition as well. Um, but we saw, of course, that the Western tradition isn't the only tradition. Um, we have this great uh, Eastern tradition, especially with the Chinese love poetry that we looked at last time. So when I talk about Sappho uh, you know, inventing and establishing our categories for love poetry, we need to remember that that's not everywhere. That's not a global thing. Um, she's establishing them in Greece, and that Greek culture is going to spread out all over the Mediterranean world, North Africa, the Middle East, and eventually Western Europe. And it's going to establish how and why we write like we do. Now, before we go, I want to acknowledge another element of Sappho's love poetry. It's not like she's just pouring out her heart in verse and, you know, however she writes it on the page is how she leaves it. No, Sappho's poetry, and perhaps you could hear it from me reading the translation in English, Sappho's poetry is written in four-line stanzas. And those four-line stanzas are highly complex in their structure, uh, kind of similar to the Gayatri meter that we looked at in the Indian tradition earlier. And these lines of these lines of verse in each stanza are three lines of eleven syllables each, and then a fourth line in each stanza of just five syllables. Um, and like we talked about with the Indian tradition, there's a real attention that the Greek poets have, especially early on, to inventive patterns of long and short syllables. For Sappho, these patterns in the first three lines of each stanza go long, short, long, short, long, short, short, long, short, long, short, and that repeats three times. Da 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 So you have three lines of that. But then you have this fourth short line that's just five syllables, and it repeats a portion of that line. It's Long, short, short, long, short. So it goes da 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 in the last two lines of each stanza. And so that da 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 really kind of brings it to a close. It's sort of a you create a pattern and then you vary it up and give us a sort of short, sweet ending. You can see this. You know, I translated this poem. Um, and so, you know, I try. I tried in our, you know, stress and unstress syllable format in English to kind of retain a little bit of the rhythm of the Greek. It's difficult, uh, but help me even now in my pain divorce me, far from cleaving grief and from murmured gossip, burst my longings bonds as an ally battle, blade drawn beside me. So that da 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 da. Um, we have. Um, it's, all, it's almost like the drums are beating uh, to really uh, punctuate the ending of it. And it really is both the, this very human universal you know, desire for the beloved, this very human universal, like, I need help from the gods, but it's also this very universal desire to order our language into formal patterns that create within the reader, within the hearer, um, a beat and a rhythm that invites them into the subject matter and into the pattern of thought and feeling that the poet is creating. This is the power of poetry. This is the power of poetry. And we see it in Sappho, just as we've seen it in all the ancient poets we've encountered. Thanks so much.